Yeah, thanks very much everybody for being here. Uh, we have our second public lecture with uh, Manfred St Steger today, um, who will talk about disjunctive globalization and the production of the unhappy consciousness. Um, if you have any questions, we can have a discussion round at the end of the webinar, and we can use the Q&A function as we did last time for those who have participated and um, for those who haven't, just click on the Q&A button that you find uh, below and ask your questions uh, by just typing them in. And uh, Roland Benedictor will moderate the, this session, this webinar session, and briefly introduce Manfred Steger as well. And thanks again for your participation. Yeah, as you all know, I'm a big fan of Manfred Works, uh, and uh, I think he's really the leading scholar in thinking the future of globalization. Uh, we had a very, very promising start with the first lecture of Manfred um, about the current states of globalization. And today he's going a little bit deeper, talking about disjunctive globalization and the production of the unhappy consciousness. And as Manfred knows, I'm convinced that only a leading scholar like him can choose such a title, which is a kind of quote by Hegel, uh, character is rising the times. And so I'm very happy to give the floor to Manfred. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, and uh, I very much uh, appreciate your kind words. Uh, and thanks to everybody at the Center for Advanced Studies to, for putting up with me uh, for a second lecture. And uh, this particular uh, lecture today is really part two of uh, what I was talking about uh, last time. So the way I would like to structure the lecture today is to uh, spend uh, at the beginning, maybe just uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, summarizing what I've been talking about last time, because those of you who were not here last time would have a hard time following today's lecture. And I think also some of you were here and don't uh, fully remember uh, some of the arguments. I think it's helpful to just uh, summarize uh, some of the things that are really important and relate to uh, the topic of uh, today, which is the production of the unhappy consciousness. So uh, if you remember, uh, basically I said the most uh, basic conceptual framework of globalization, which I define as the worldwide expansion intensification of social relations and consciousness is to divide it up into two spheres and say there's an objective uh, sphere which deals with connectivities and mobilities of capital of goods of services, technologies and people and then there is a subjective uh, sphere or dimension of globalization that deals with worldwide connectivities and mobilities of ideas and ideologies and meanings and symbols and narratives. So in other words, that's the, the side of consciousness. And what I did last time, I spent the entire lecture uh, in the sphere of objectivity. In other words, uh, in the objective world, talking about uh, what is going on in the world out there as I see it with regard to globalization. What I'd like to do today is to make this shift to subjectivity, the shift to consciousness from macro to micro. And therefore, the key question of today's lecture is one that addresses consciousness. What is the relationship between objective globalization dynamics, that's what I was talking about last time, and people's subjective everyday experience in our era of the great unsettling. So by way of summarizing some of the highlights from last time, uh, here is what we need to remember. The analytical framework for lecture one and today's lecture, lecture two is that we need to deal with three conceptual components to assess the current globalization system. And then also, as Roland uh, uh, stated at the beginning, to have a better sense of where globalization is moving. In other words, the future trajectory of globalization. So 
the three basic components are the great unsettling, which I talked about last time, disjunctive globalization dynamics or disjointed, unbalanced globalization dynamics in the world out there, which I talked about last time, and the unhappy consciousness, which I have not talked about and which will be the main subject uh, for today's lecture. But let's again, just review very briefly the first two, the great unsettling and disjunctive globalization. So if you remember, what I was arguing is that we find ourselves today in an intense era of social instability and insecurity and volatility. And I put up here just a few markers of the last 20 years that give us a sense of the kinds of disruptions, the kinds of instabilities that add up to what I call the great unsettling. So starting with uh, the Battle of Seattle, the ensuing uh, global trade protests at the Fin de Siècle, uh, going on to 9-11 and transnational terrorism, of course, the global financial crisis and European sovereign debt crisis, migration issues all around the world throughout the 2010s, which to some extent uh, were uh, leading to what was called the globalization backlash, the surge of national populism in the 2010s. And now we are hopefully, uh, at least parts of the world, uh, beginning to pull out of what was uh, one of the major, major crises, global crises, uh, in, certainly in modernity, which is uh, the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So these are some of the markers. These are some of the milestones of the great unsettling, which is now lasted for about a generation. And then the second uh, component was disjunctive globalization. And I asked you last time to consider uh, a slightly more complex, but I think really useful uh, globalization framework. You remember the first framework is just objective and subjective globalization. This framework, which I developed uh, with my colleague, Paul James uh, at Western Sydney University, is talking about four major globalization formations. We can also see them as tectonic plates that are moving, that are getting bigger and smaller, that are colliding with each other, that are moving away from each other. And those four globalization tectonic plates are the global spatial mobility and connectivity of ideas, of information, of data. In other words, in this case, in our time, very much digital, and I called that disembodied globalization. Then we had embodied globalization, which is the global spatial mobility and connectivity of people, or you could say beings, because it can be extended to bodies, non-human bodies, uh, such as animals, uh, such as bacteria, and so on. Then we have the uh, global spatial mobility and connectivity of organizations. That would be institutional globalization. And finally, the fourth tectonic plate, the global spatial mobility of, and connectivity of things, of objects. In the 1990s, that was how globalization was defined in terms of primarily trade, right? Tradable commodities were at the very forefront of what people associated with when they were talking about globalization. My argument is that we don't need to split uh, the pie anymore into what used to be the major dimensions of globalization in terms of economics, politics, and culture, ecology, military, and so on. Because these dynamics, economics, politics, culture, ecology, military, they occur in all of those four globalization uh, formations. And it is this new typology this fourfold typology of the movement of ideas, of people, of organizations, and of things that really defines the objective movement of globalization. And it defines it in terms of a disjuncture, a disconnection that is occurring between and among these plates. Now, when I say disjuncture, disconnection, disjointedness, we have 
four criteria by which we both qualitatively and quantitatively can measure globalization dynamics. And that is extensity. In other words, the breadth of globalization, how far does it extend? Is it just two continents? Is it more than that? Intensity, how deep, how intense is globalization? So that's depth. Velocity, how fast are these plates moving? And impact, what sort of impact on organizations, on families? And in this case today, on individual consciousness are we experiencing? So my argument last time, if you remember, was that the reason I call it disjunctive globalization is because disembodied globalization, remember the movement of data, of ideas, of information is growing immensely, is quickening, is widening, is intensifying, it has greater impact and it's reaching into and remaking all the other formations. I have an example here in terms of disembodied surveillance regimes. I will get back to that today towards the end of my lecture. But I think we're all familiar with how surveillance has really become an issue with regard to global dynamics. So what is happening is that disembodied globalization is growing at the expense and intensifying at the expense of the other three forms of globalization. So object related globalization, institutionally related globalization, embodied globalization, vis-a-vis -vis disembodied globalization or digital globalization are losing out. Digital globalization is faster, more intense, more extensive, more wide, and has a greater impact. That's why I call it disjunctive. And this disjuncture is basically very much what people are talking about when they're talking about the digital age, the great digital leap forward that pertains to everything some globalization analysts associated with the fourth industrial revolution, right? Artificial intelligence, internet of uh, things, uh, uh, 3D printing, all of those things. So, get back to that. So, what I'm saying then is this is sort of the summary from last time is that this is what characterizes objective globalization, globalization in the world out there, this disjuncture. And you can see right away, and this was another very uh, final point that I made in, the, in, in my last lecture, that we can't really say that we are living in, in, a, in a time of deglobalization, even though some of those tectonic plates of globalization are stagnating, not growing very quickly. Some are decreasing even. But you can see that disembodied globalization is not only very much alive, but stronger and faster and quicker and wider and more impactful than ever before. So it's not deglobalization, but reglobalization, a profound rearrangement of globalization's formations that move at different speeds and at different levels of intensity. So the story of the current moment is not deglobalization in the world out there. The story of the current moment is reglobalization, the emergent power and significant significance of disembodied globalization. So what we now have to do is we have to now link or move from this lecture one that was all about those objective movements of disjuncture in the world out there to subjective globalization dynamics. In other words, I'm asking you to please follow me in turning your analytic spotlight from the macro level to the micro level. Remember the question for today's lecture, how do current globalization dynamics impact individual self-consciousness and thereby, of course, also formations of identity. I will argue today that what we're seeing is an unsettling that we already discussed on the objective level, reverberating all the way down to the subjective level, and even an unsettling that goes as deep as 
not just epistemological levels, but ontological levels, levels of uh, existence, of foundations of modern personhood that are being changed. So the growing disjuncture that we're seeing in the world out there is actually also a disjuncture that is reflected in individual consciousness. So uh, the disconnection between people's everyday experiencing of, uh, experience of intensifying global interconnectivity, particularly in virtual reality, digital globalization, and their existence in the more slow moving spheres of embodied globalization, of objectified globalization, of institutional globalization, produces what the German philosopher Georg Friedrich Hegel called the in the phenomenology of the spirit, the unhappy consciousness. So here's my argument. What is happening in the world out there is reflected in the world in here, in individual consciousness, as a production of an unhappy consciousness. Now, what is this unhappy consciousness? Uh, the Australian philosopher Peter Singer uh, really very nicely summarized what Hegel basically identified as the unhappy consciousness. So let me just read this to you. The unhappy consciousness aspires to be independent of the material world, to resemble God, and to be eternal and purely spiritual, you might say purely digital in our era. Yet at the same time, it recognizes that it is part of the material world, that its physical desires and its pains and pleasures are real and inescapable. As a result, the unhappy consciousness is divided against itself. So the unhappy consciousness is a divided self. It is a self that is divided internally in a sense of relating to an objective world of interconnectivity of global flows that is losing out compared to a world of flows that occurs in terms of data, digitality, internet. Now, there are a number of thinkers, social thinkers, who have taken up this concept of the unhappy consciousness. So for example, the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard interpreted Hegel's unhappy consciousness in a situation that develops when a person lives in the past or in the future without being really reconciled to their present self, to their present essence. That is part of what I'm talking about, but doesn't really quite capture the sort of division that I have in mind. Another current of social thinkers, the Frankfurt School, critical theorists of the Frankfurt School, such as Herbert Marcuse, also took this concept of the unhappy consciousness, and they linked it to a critique of consumerism and the culture industry in the context of 20th century capitalism. And the funny thing is that they reversed the meaning, right? So they took the unhappy consciousness and made it the happy consciousness, which is sort of an ironic way of talking about a hollow or very vapid state of mind that is linked to consumerism. And they said that this sort of happy consciousness is really hostile to ethical reflection because it's only happy when it shops. It was seen as draining, as sort of being potentially uncritical of what? Of autonomy, of individuality, of reflection. So they kind of turned around this idea of the unhappy consciousness, made it the happy consciousness, and linked it to consumerism. Again, there are some ways in which I also link to capitalism, as you can see from my lecture number one, and I also want to talk a little bit about consumerism, but that's not really the core of how I see it. I find the unhappy consciousness in its original Hegelian sense extremely useful in its application 
to the production of everyday consciousness in the context of these disjunctive movements of globalization that characterize our current moment of the great unsettling. Now, in the 21st century, this sort of these sort of dislocating experiencing uh, experiences on on an individual psychological level have been documented by a number of uh, social thinkers and social scientists for example sigmund bauman a social theorist argued that many people living under these current conditions of what i call digital globalization living in what he called a liquid modernity they lose a sense of familiarity with their local environment. They spawn intense feelings of alienation, marginalization, disembeddedness. I really like what Bauman is saying, even though I can't fully go along with some of the postmodernist implications that he draws from that. But still, I think he's sort of uh, using it in many ways very similarly to what I have in mind. What I like even better is a social psychologist by the name of Kenneth Gergen, who characterizes persons that are deeply enmeshed in digital, global digital technologies as absent present, absent hyphen present. And he wants to explain how it's possible to be physically present in one specific locality, but psychologically lodged in virtual global space. Now, this is very, very close to the way I see the unhappy consciousness, right? So for me, the concept of the unhappy consciousness signifies this uneasy coexistence of a person who is absent from the local because they're hooked into cyberspace, although they're physically present in the local, right? They're very, very localized in their apartment, sitting right in front of the screen, as you are doing now, as I am doing now. So physically, we are very localized, but psychologically, in terms of our consciousness. Now, think the soreness, though. Excuse me? I think there was a little bit of an interference. I just heard Roland. Uh, anyway, uh, so what I'm saying here is that even though we are physically uh, present in the local, we are actually psychologically, in terms of consciousness, we are actually right. So uh, from the local, and at the same time, we are present in the virtual global sphere, although we are physically absent, right, in the global sphere because we are locally still physically ensconced. So there is this powerful dialectic of absence and presence that drives, drives what? The current production of individual selves that are torn, the divided self, the unhappy consciousness, torn between the new attachments to the pleasures and pains of digital mobility and their old affections for the political and cultural fixity of familiar local and national life worlds. So my analysis goes deeper than necessary, but limited assessment of the role of the political economy in producing people's consciousness in terms of heightened sentiments of dislocation. So if you know Guy Standing's work, uh, he wrote a very important book called The Precariat. He's arguing because of disconnections of uh, uh, unsettling of instability in the economic realm, capitalism, uh, people are experiencing increasingly anxiety, alienation, enemy, anger, and that leads to obviously certain political consequences. It also leads to new social stratifications, new classes that emerge, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's important, an important analysis. But he's very much located in terms of just political economy. That's one factor, but it's not enough. Connecting the macro level, as I did, to the micro level, my framework makes for, I think, a better understanding of how precisely various objective dynamics, not just the political economy, is working its way 
into the subjective sphere of globalization, of the global consciousness, of ideas and ideologies and imaginaries that flow across national boundaries. Okay, a lot of philosophy, a lot of theory. So let's move on to some empirical material in order to sort of shore up the case that I'm making here. The unhappy consciousness. This gives you, uh, and this is just from this year, daily time spent with the internet per capita worldwide. It's a global measure from 2011 to 2021. So it's very recent by device. So the black bar is uh, mobile connectivity, mobile digitality, and the blue bar is desktop, uh, laptop, and so on. You can see that that stays pretty much the same over the 10 year period. In other words, desktop connectivity is pretty much where it was in 2011 in terms of uh, uh, minutes, 37 to 43 minutes people spent laptop or desktop. What would happen in terms of mobile devices? What we're seeing here is that people, uh, in terms of iPads or iPhones or tablets, uh, uh, and, 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 and it has shot up in 10 years from 32 minutes per day to 155 minutes per day, almost uh, more than two and a half hours. So clearly, Remember, absence, presence, or even though they're locally uh, present, they're locally absent, and where are they? They're present in the digital sphere, in the sphere that opens up through their mobile devices. Another very useful, uh, sorry for the quality of the slide here, but I think you can read it. Where do people spend most time on social media. Again, I'm, I'm very fond of worldwide measures here. This is the average time spent connected to social networks during a typical day in 2019. Saw the world average, right? and here now we're looking at specific countries. Philippines, four hours, four hours. If you say that six hours a day are spent sleeping, right, we're left with 18 to 16 hours. I'm going to turn off my video because I think we may have a little bit of instability. Uh, hours of waking time. Out of four hours, four hours are spent on social media. Nigeria, three hours and 36 minutes. It's interesting that countries in the global south are actually. Uh, higher than most countries in the global north. So the United States is about an average uh, two hours, as you can see here. UK is down to an hour and 50 minutes, Japan less than an hour. But again, you see the point that I'm trying to make, which is that increasingly we are spending more and more time in that digital fear of global connectivity even though locally we are uh, present. But our consciousness clearly is not as much present in the local as it used to be. Okay. All right, I'll get to that just in a second. So let's talk about the impact of the last crisis, right? Great unsettling, COVID-19 on the dynamics that I was just laying out to you in terms of the production of the unhappy consciousness. So under extreme conditions of enforced lockdowns, the tactile experience of the local shrinks to the size of one's house or one's apartment, plus perhaps the supermarket next door that we still can go out to. The local embodied becomes less of a factor in the flow of everyday consciousness. This absent present dialectic that I was talking about is accelerated and accentuated through COVID-19, especially during uh, lockdown. When uh, parks are closed, local art events are canceled, when uh, everything migrates online, when people are forced to reduce their physical ties to the local, 
and their experience is pretty much uh, focused on digital mediated form. And the actual uh, embodiment shrinks to the size of one's apartment under extreme conditions, perhaps a supermarket nearby. And social distancing is one wonderful example for that, right? We are asked to socially distance, become socially distant. In other words, the embodiment we're digitalizing via Zoom or other platforms is very, very much increasing. So I think most of you know that Zoom, for example, accommodated in June of 2020, during the height of the pandemic, over 300 million daily meeting participants. The number of corporate users shot up to about 300,000, which represented an increase of 350% over a few months. The same is true for other social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Snapchat. Experienced double digit increases in the first two quarters of 2020. In April 2020, UK adults spent longer than four hours daily online each day. So in other words, they caught up with the Philippines as you can see here. Of course, we all know, uh, those of us who are educators uh, and students, that scores of colleges and universities migrated online. In other words, physical face-to-face -face interaction in the classroom gave way to uh, uh, digital, digitally mediated learning uh, models. The concept of international student didn't mean much anymore because the borderless landscapes of virtual reality actually served as a gathering place for all learners, regardless of where they were located physically. Think of health delivery, telemedicine, that really picked up, especially during uh, that uh, time of, of, of COVID that we're still in it, you know, to some extent. So uh, another example, and I promised you I would come back to that, is the intensification of abstracted and automated surveillance that, of course, also increased very much during COVID. It diminished our ability to sort of live uh, unwatched. Surveillance pretty much became part of people's uh, work in terms of their uh, uh, office work, their home office, being turned into sort of a two-way surveillance station. So those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, a uh, book called Surveillance Capitalism, will know that her main argument, and this was of course accelerated during COVID, is that now human nature, she says, is scrapped, torn, taken for another century's market project. In other words, data mining, has become a very capitalism indeed, uh, I would argue that one of the most lucrative uh, revenue streams is connected to data mining, which again highlights in my view, this uh, sort of consciousness phase that we're moving in. Because on one hand, people want to be present online, they want to play their games, they want to take advantage of all these online suites that are being offered. On the other hand, they're of course turned off by data mining, by surveillance. So they are happy and they're unhappy at the same time. They are unhappy when they are online because they feel that even though they enjoy the experience, they're happy about that, it's not the kind of experience, the unmediated experience, the experience without data mining that they really would like to have. So that in, in itself also reaches very deeply into uh, this sort of unhappy consciousness that I was talking about. These are teens who have spent more than four hours daily using electronic devices before, during, during the coronavirus age. Now look at this, small children, between zero and four, who previously, before the crisis, spent 13%, there were 13% of those who spent more than four hours or four hours at least 
If you go to the age group of five to 10, it went from 17% to 44%, more than four hours daily. If you go to 11 to 13, you go from 23 to 47. And then finally, between 14 and 17 is really the worst, go 32 to 62. Another example here. So uh, ages 18 to 24, 58% were more likely to report symptoms of anxiety and depression. And here, another one, COVID's widespread impact on mental health in terms of share of experience and thought it was difficult to cope with during the pandemic. So you got 39% of Americans who reported that. Canadians, 25%. Sweden, it's down to 18%, no way to 10. What is it done? The first one has to do with the great unsettling. We need to challenge the condu conditions that produce the great unsettling. We need to rebalance and re we are way off. We are badly off in terms of unbalance. We're spending way too much time and there's consequences. It is objective consequences and subjective consequences. Some of them good, but a lot of them not good. Now, again, how do we transform the conditions? And I, again, I, I wanna leave that open for discussion. I'm sure you have uh, questions or uh, ideas about that. But what I wanna leave you with is that we need a fundamental transformation we need to seriously think and act and change. We are migrating very quickly and intensively into virtual space, into digital globalization. If we don't have enough time for face-to-face -face relationships, if we don't have enough time for local community building, and it remains to be seen what's going to happen after the pandemic. Have we picked up habits like Zooming, like conventions that are no longer gonna be face-to-face, -face, like teaching courses, like giving presentations where we have to worry about unstable connections like in this one, or are we going to rebalance again? And this goes back to what you do so well at uh, the Center for Advanced Studies at URAC. And that is to think about re to think about the new forms globalization, connectivity and flows, movements and imaginations are taking. And to see the warning signs, the warning signs in the world out there, objectively speaking, in terms of disjuncture, but all in terms of changing of our consciousness in a direction that is a consciousness, again, going back to Hegel, divided against itself. That's my main point. So we need to sort of overcome the gap. We need to overcome the division. We need to mediate more. And I think one form of mediation has to do with giving the self its due in the physical world, in the face-to-face -face world, as much as in the world that is a digitally mediated world. I don't think we found the balance. I'm afraid we're moving too quickly and too intensely into an era that may be a place of no return. But as an optimist, uh, I think and I hope that the end of the pandemic will give us some breathing space and some ways of reconceptualizing the connection and relationship between these two important components, uh, three important components of globalization that I talked about in these two lectures. The great unsettling, disjunctive globalization dynamics, and the subjective globalization of the unhappy consciousness. Thank you very much. Mille grazie. Thank you very much, Manfred. And um, thank you for this great uh, second lecture. I think we um, were actually not only uh, experiencing parts of what you were saying, meaning that we are also kind of at the mercy of technology and connections nowadays. So uh, thanks uh, nevertheless for having kept on with the speech and with your lecture. Um, we could now start with um, the questions. I think Roland would like to react and ask a first questions and for all the others don't don't hesitate to just um, throw them in the chat. 
Yes, Manfred, despite uh, the very poor connection, I found um, it very important that you address the unhappy consciousness, as you call it, uh, which is a distress that is reaching deep into the guts of globalization, so to say. Uh, just to mention one example from one of the most globalized countries on earth, Germany. I think uh, Germany is second or third in the level of uh, globalization, internationalization of its economy and its social structure in the meantime, also due to migration and export orientation. Uh, Germany just a few days ago published by uh, the means of the renowned Allensbach Institute, which is the most renowned um, internationally of Germany, a poll among uh, a representative number of Germans, more than 10,000, uh, and the, uh, about the freedom of speech and the impression if you can uh, tell your opinion freely in Germany today and in the coming years. Um, and the results were shocking because Germans said uh, to a, a clear majority, over 60% said they would not be able uh, to tell their opinion freely on uh, hot topics like migration, uh, like the elite decisions of the German governments, um, like technology um, or other issues. And uh, what the outcome was, was that people felt absolutely unhappy, less with their lives because the economy is going uh, relatively well, even due to, um, after Corona, but uh, more with the social connections with, with democracy as such. So many in Europe, and this is not limited to Germany, have an unhappy consciousness indeed, as you so brilliantly outlined it, uh, but less because they're necessarily uh, uh, worse off after the crisis, but, if the, but, but rather because they feel that th there was a process connected with globalization, what is, has often been called unjustly elite globalization, um, where, where, so to say, there is a, a thought police installed in open uh, societies where a certain uh, current and stream of thought um, originating in the 60s has taken over the intellectual lead and where political correctness is um, basically excluding large parts of the opinion spectrum and parts of the political spectrum from public debate out of a moralization uh, of the public sphere. And I think something very similar has been happening in the United States, in the United Kingdom, uh, which has co-triggered uh, the populist rebellion, which is, uh, thank God, after us. Um, and and um, we are moving beyond it in the United States to some extent, but the problem remains. So my first question would be, um, after all what you say, it, one thing is clear that those people living in autocracies and in the new autocracies like uh, China or Russia or even uh, Turkey, uh, they are necessarily unhappy because they are oppressed, they are surveilled, as you said, uh, they don't live in, in an open society. But even the open societies experience a kind of unhappy consciousness because there is an ease with the state uh, of democracy as such, as experienced from within. What do you make out of it? Has this been solved, this problem with a new US administration? Is it solved uh, if there will be new governments um, in, in the West or where do we move in this, in this sense? Manfred? Uh, thank you, thank you again, Roland. Uh, this is this is really important. Uh, what what you were not only asking, but what you were talking about in, in in the case of Germany, because what you're doing already is you're already doing what I uh, asked we do uh, collectively in this last slide, uh, in terms of what is to be done, and you laying out very clearly that there's a democracy deficit that is growing. So rebalancing means that we have to find ways for people to have meaningful input in the political system. That it seems to be slipping away, partially as a result of 
uh, those new forms of surveillance that you were addressing. So I think this is a very, very concrete of what has to be done in terms of rebalancing this. Manfred. Uh, Manfred, are you still there? Yes. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, the the, the connection was interrupted. Oh, okay. Uh, did did you hear did you hear parts of what I said or, yes. or nothing? Yes, no parts of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So uh, again, what, what you did in laying out the German case, I think you were already addressing what needs to be done with regard to the democracy deficit. Mm -hmm. uh, with regard to uh, what you were asking with the new US administration, that we have left this behind us, the sort of national populist backlash. Uh, I'm, I'm actually worried that it may come back in four years. I mean, nobody knows. Uh, I hope not. So for the next four years, to be very and part of, I think, part of the task of the Biden administration will be precisely what you said in terms of uh, people's sense of connecting to the political system, to connecting to the social system, having meaningful input, being listened to, and having a chance to register uh, their views and their preferences. And I think there's a lot of unhappiness also with regard to, as you know, this whole uh, uh, voting issue, this big lie about, uh, you know, the, the elections were stolen and this idea that a lot of people buy into that anything that is not embodied, in other words, people queuing up and voting in person, whether it's even if it's, if if it's a mail-in vote, it's seen as illegitimate, which is interesting because it moves in the sphere of what I call disembodied connections, right? So in other words, the people are saying everything that's disembodied, we can't, you know, the voting machines, the digital voting machines, we can't trust. We can't even trust mailboxes. The only thing we can trust is embodied relationship, the old fashioned way, right? So I think there's a real challenge here for the Biden administration. And I think for all systems, for all democratic systems, to rethink what it means to build a society increasingly around digital connectivities. So, you know, and, and obviously in China, Russia, Turkey, or, or you know, authoritarian regimes, I, I think my sense is that a lot of people have already given up to some extent and simply are, you know, unhappy, but happy enough in terms of their economic situation, if it's good enough to just keep quiet. But again, this could explode at any time. I would not be surprised if we would see, uh, you know, unrest in those air, in those countries that you were talking about. And again, going back to the sense of a divided self, that on one hand, you know, it is wonderful to have this digital world and to be connected in those ways, and it has certain advantages. On the other hand, it really undermines a lot of the kind of sociability that people as, uh, associate with happiness, you know, with a sense of, of community, especially local community, especially regional kinds of communities. Yeah. Manfred, are you still there? Yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, I, I just just to answer very briefly, I think we had the discussion here at Eurac about this problem. Um, why do people feel neglected? Why do people feel excluded from the democratic discourse, even if they can vote? We have four or five uh, uh, elections every year, the communal level, on the, on the regional level, on the national level, on the European level, and everything in between. Uh, so, so if there are too many elections, why do they still feel uh, excluded? And um, we came to the conclusion that it is also a problem of the elites. So who yeah. dominates the discourse in open societies? Are those educated? Are the intellectuals? Are the, the opinion leaders? 
which have no formal legitimation by democracy, but have a very strong role, much stronger than in autocracies. And I always say, uh, we must really uh, also question ourselves. So globalism as, a, an, as an ideology of very different uh, um, kinds of, of parts that is composed in a complex way, but we as, we as those who have proposed globalization, uh, not necessarily the neoliberal part of it, but in this sense, the cosmopolitan part of it, uh, we really have to criticize ourselves also because it, it cannot be just yeah. the fault of populists. There are deeper roots of this unhappy consciousness that are, have also to do with a certain attitude of the elites uh, who all too often have ignored the, the, the sense of normal and normalization and the need for, for a medium uh, ground in societies. And perhaps we were too fast. Perhaps uh, something were, um, was too much inclined to a certain political agenda. And I think one of the f most important issues I had, and that's uh, I, with what I con would conclude the outlook uh, on this unhappy consciousness, is that we have really to uh, undergo um, a soul search uh, among the elites, among the proponents of democracy, um, and search for new inclusive ways also for diverging opinions, even of those who oppose globalization in the first place. Otherwise, um, we, we will, in my view, we be hardly uh, able to restore a kind of participative um, form of globalization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if I'm completely off track. And no, the I, problem, I, I the agree. Problem, no, I agree. Go ahead. The problem with this is, and to conclude again, uh, that this is uh, what I say is often identified with a neoconservative agenda, but that is not the case. In order to save liberal democracy, uh, you have to question the, the form of liberalism that we had so far. And the form of liberalism was a very complex and to some extent also hybrid format between neoliberal, expansive, uh, predatory capitalism and a highly over-idealistic cosmopolitanism that formed an unholy alliance to some extent. So we, we really have to go to the roots also of, of this in our own work, I, I would suggest. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think that uh, you know certainly elites have to do some serious soul searching as you suggested. Uh, there's no question about that. Uh, but I, I would also say that uh, if, digital globalization and digitization in general uh, keeps going in terms of the pace that we're experiencing right now, I'm not sure uh, how much time we have in terms of agency to control and to change what is going on in terms of the imbalance. Because, uh, I mean, as you know, Roland, uh, algorithms are really starting to run our lives. And they can be very wonderful, like when you come home and, 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 and you have a voice activated uh, lighting system uh, or sound system and so on and so forth, sure. But it's also something that basically takes away agency in terms of uh, taking away control, setting the parameters, uh, narrowing uh, the, the perspective, the choices, the what is possible range that a lot of creative people thrive on. Uh, Self-driving cars is another example. Yeah, it sounds great, but you know, it gives you more time to do what? To check your text messages, probably. So again, uh, you know, I am not against technology. That's very important. Technology has always been with us and needs to be socially integrated. I'm against the imbalanced way in which connectivity and movement, local, national, and global, is currently playing itself out. I think we need to find a better balance. And if we don't do that, then I'm not sure if in 20 years from now, we're still in a position to actually, when I say what is to be done, to actually exert the kind of agency that allows us significant recalibrations of this imbalance. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Roland, thanks Manfred for the question and answer. We now have another question from Ingrid Kopler, 
which regards more the, the, uh, the issues of work and schooling. So she writes, I also find the topic of work interesting. We know that there were and will be negative consequences for kids and young people, and it's better if they return to school. But also companies have now switched to digital solution, smart working or home office. Large companies sell their buildings because it has been shown that offices are no longer needed. But what does that mean for people? We have seen, for example, that this has an impact on the inequality between men and women. But I think also this has consequences on the unhappy consciousness, and I think there is no return. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Ingrid puts it, uh, I think, very well. Uh, I, I uh, absolutely agree with her. You know, I'm thinking, I'm thinking specifically uh, in, in terms of how uh, this home office is being marketed as a wonderful solution for everybody involved, right? Because supposedly you're going to be able to spend more time at home, but what do you have to do? You have to set up an office. Where do you set it up in your micro context? Which space is going to be sacrificed for this office? And then the office itself becomes an expression of the divide itself, right? Because at certain times, nobody can enter. It has got to have a door, or it's got to have a screen. And if you have children, what does this mean with regard to children's no-go zone for certain times? It becomes your own house, becomes uh, sort of like a two self house. One self is the embodied self that can go to certain kinds of rooms at any time uh, and enjoy that face to face contact. The other one is the sort of digital self space uh, that is uh, highly regulated and, uh, you know, represents a, a real division that goes down to the very micro level of your own home, of your own house. So what I'm saying is that, yes, of course, it has advantages in terms of commuting, but also disadvantages in terms of uh, not hanging out with people at the coffee machine and chatting with them and finding out what's going on in their lives, even at least to some extent, and, and making meaningful connections that go just beyond a purely quantitative approach in terms of productivity. Uh, also, home office opens, again, surveillance opens up the possibility, and as we all know, it does, of quantifying in ways your output, your work, that was never there before. You are basically subjected to a camera for the entire time that you're working. So everything is recorded. Everything is, is basically uh, quantifiable. And uh, a lot of the quality that comes through creative breaks or chats with people that are informal, are no longer part of that because they are seen as lost time, when in reality, it wasn't lost time. It was actually very creative time. So again, uh, I very much agree with uh, Ingrid and, and, and find that, uh, you know, again, there may not be no return. That's exactly where we don't want to go. We don't want to go to a place where we're in so deep that it doesn't go out anymore, that, that we can't return anymore. Yeah, thanks Manfred for your answer and thanks Ingrid for your great question. I would also um, um, like to uh, ask you something Manfred in regard yeah. to this topic of work, home office and uh, being home and isolated, although connected so widely through uh, digital tools. And in fact, um, the issue of interaction, social interaction also has a very, uh, reinforcing component for what concerns um, the self-resilience of a person. So um, some psychologists would, would define resilience as not being alone physically, as having someone to um, ask help for or support emotionally and everything. So um, yes, I think that could also be a very, as you say, unhappy consciousness, but meaning also that people would get much less resilient to new crises, new shocks, and it becomes kind of a, a vicious circle that, that, yes, a downward spiral or something that, um, do you think that will be more or more of an issue in the next few years or with the rising home office normality? Yes, I think, I think it will be. And, you know, if we spend so much time in cyberspace, in terms of making social relations, 
Uh, I think what we know from psychology is that 80 to 90% of our consciousness is what, what they call practical consciousness, which is routines, which is uh, not really so much reflected upon. It's, you know, the daily, the ordinary life as we experience it. And if that practical consciousness switches from embodied and objectified and inst institutional to primarily disembodied, it means that increasingly our routines, our consciousness routines, and I think this is what you're talking about, our consciousness routines become also routinized in ways where we feel uncomfortable even having the sort of embodied relationship or it, we, we are become sort of uh, unused to how to do it, how to relate to people other than if it's electronically mediated. And the support that you're talking about, the physical support that we need or an emotional support, the embodied support uh, might be something that people increasingly feel can be provided perhaps by uh, artificial intelligence, perhaps by robots, whatever, because the practical consciousness is calibrated towards making connections with people online, period. And it becomes routinized that way. And everything else becomes some, become, gets some, uh, somehow awkward. And that can be taken over, not by human, the embodiment can be taken over again by some sort of technological device. So yes, I, I totally agree with you. And again, you know, we need to go with change. I don't want to be reactionary. Uh, I'm just feeling that the balance is really, really badly off. And that's one of the issues in globalization is that I think that global connectivity is becoming more and more a question of digital connectivity rather than uh, a more balanced, a more rounded out form of connectivity and, and, and mobility. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, Manfred. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I see that Roland has his hand risen. Um, Roland, do you want to ask something? Yeah, if nobody else has another question, I would have many, Manfred, as you know. But one topic I think that has been brought up by Ingrid is so, so exciting and so important for the future education. And yes. this topic is often banalized and I, I cannot hear all the discourses, we need more education and all this kind of stuff. Uh, what, what a fact is, is that we have experienced a massive increase of real-time information of new social media, but also of a helplessness in front of news. Uh, the one-way TV screen that tells you only bad news day and night and now even in real time on your phone um, that makes you crazy because it gives you no chance to react. You're, you feel helpless and this creates part of, in my view and in my personal experience, part of the unhappy consciousness. And yeah. my question is, where, where have we reacted to this development? This development of the new social media, of this real-time bombardment with breaking news and so on, um, in Europe, at least, or in large parts of the Western Hemisphere and open societies, is a relatively recent development um, of the past one and a half decades, perhaps, or, or, or maybe starting from, from the start of the century, but certainly a younger development. We are not used to it. Where in the educational sphere have we reacted to it? I mean, my experience is, and I, I have um, uh, more than a decade in the United States, I, I have some experience in the UK, I know Germany, I know Central Europe quite well. Uh, we had, have not, not reacted at all. Where is globalization taught as a study object in schools? Where is it part of uh, civic education? And most important of all, where have we reacted with regard to the shrinking, the so-called shrinking of the present that has been pointed out by German sociology since the 1990s? The present is shrinking. Uh, the, the validity uh, of, of values, order structures, perceptions is shrinking dramatically uh, so that the future is always becoming closer and is always becoming more important, more dense in the present where do we teach futures literacy, for example, as it has been developed by um, UNESCO only recently over the past half decade? Where, where is it implemented? So no wonder that people feel uncomfortable because the world is getting more complex. 
you, you get bombarded with bad news. You cannot react. It's a one-way bombardment. And we have no preparation in our schools for children. Why have we not introduced globalization as a school topic 10 years ago? So Manfred, this, th these are the questions that are hunting me because always say we need more education. No, it's about what kind of education and not just more because we have already almost too much in my view. Yes, uh, absolutely right, Roland. And this is where it links to global capitalism, I think, because it's based on a model that is more is preferred to less. So the assumption is that more information is better than less information. And there's no limit to growth of information. And as you said, uh, the, the present is eaten up by the future, is eaten up by the stream of data that comes at us, and it's seen as an unmitigated good. And you are absolutely right. And I would add, wait, not, not just education, but my question is religion, churches. They have an answer for that. It's called meditation, it's called prayer. It may sound very conservative, you could even call it introspection if you don't like, or contemplation. If you don't, and I'm not connecting it to any kind of institutional setting. But where are people meditative? Where are people learning to be meditative? Where are, again, is, is, is there a sort of education that is more attuned to the present, that takes back from the future the present? And it's not even a question of teaching globalization. I think for me, it's a question, and this is where we get to the unhappy consciousness, of educating the consciousness. If our consciousness is unhappy as a result of the disjunctural movement that I was describing, we need forms of education that bring us back to the present moment, that bring us back to the sort of embodied introspective and of course, interaction in a, in a community setting that can again be a church setting, it can be sports setting. I'll give you a very funny example, Roland. I'm, I'm not sure if I brought that up at my last lecture, but uh, the funny example is that increasingly German right-wing nationalist circles are very upset about the fact that their members no longer come to the Stammtisch and the sort of small local settings, embodied settings that they used to come to because they have spent so much time beefing up the digital presence. In other words, even in those sort of extremist uh, political communities, the unhappy consciousness is taking hold. So when you go back to education, what we need in my view is a complete rethinking of education in terms of, as you say, a technologically uh, conscientious, reflective, and ethical approach. I'm afraid, though, that the neoliberal model of, 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 of market economy that underlies education, and I think that's where your criticism of, of liberalism probably comes in as well, is looking at technology as the unmitigated good. The more information, the better. So if you say, you come up and you say, I would like to reform it in terms of uh, teaching kids how not to be online constantly, how to sort of interact with each other in ways that is very physical, that is sometimes also quiet. Uh, what does it mean to be introspective? What does it mean to listen to another person? How, what does it mean to speak in, in an intimate circle and so on and so forth? That probably will be interpreted, as you put it, as conservative, as, as reactionary and so on. And I think it's absolutely not. It can't be any more progressive because that's the only way in which we can claw back the present that we are losing. Thank you.